All right, folks, we are back again, live online for those folks who want to join virtually. We've got 31, 38 people so far. I find online usually the number grows to like, I don't know, 125, 130 or so. And I know that sometimes more than one person can get together and watch it on a single device. But I also can track actually how many views the videos get posted up, see, get after. And actually, usually it's in the hundreds. So hopefully people are tuning in and, and getting the lectures and everything's good. Um, I have remembered to charge my mic again today. I started charging it about an hour ago. So I think I'll have enough time to get through the class. If not, I will just switch like I did last class. And we are continuing today our unit on water. Where last class we talked about, a little bit about the chemistry of water, the structure. We talked about hydrogen bonding. We talked about polarity. We talked about things that would dissolve in water. And then we talked about um, some issues around water, like we talked about hard water scale and how to clean that, what the effect it might have on soap or detergent or shampoo or whatever. We talked about the pros and cons of different types of soaps and things like that. Uh, we're going to today focus more down into the issue of water we drink and less about, you know, water we use to do our laundry or whatever. And I just want to say, like, if you are drinking water on campus here at Acadia, uh, unless you buy bottled water, you will be drinking water that's been treated somehow. Water that was naturally present out somewhere in the environment, you know, I guess we could say it was in um, a reservoir or it was in a well or whatever. And it was taken and it was treated through many steps before it comes to you in the tap. We're going to talk about pretty briefly what those steps are and why we do them and how it ensures that we get safe drinking water. So, you know, this is sort of a, a schematic which is showing the general way this is done, starting with some source of fresh water, in this example, a lake. I think in Wolfville, the reservoir in Reservoir Park, I think used to be where they got the water for the town. I think they may have changed that though. I don't, I don't actually know where Wolfville gets their water anymore, but I'm not sure if it's the reservoir. If you were to drink water from a place like the reservoir, just the way it would be, like standing water that's open like that, would probably not be very safe to drink because, you know, take a walk around there and you see people, their dogs are going for a swim in there and, you know, leaves and stuff fall into it and it's, you know, certainly not pure clean water and it's certainly not um, free of microbes. So to prevent people from getting sick, we do all of these steps. First thing is just basically you pump it out and you run it through a screen. The screen just filters out, you know, any leaves or, you know, large pieces of debris. Then it goes through a, a process called flocculation, which we'll talk about. And then um, goes through a coal. Ah, come back. Goes through a coal filter, chlorination, fluoridation, storage, and then eventually distribution. So the first stage that I really want to talk about here is the flocculation stage. And that's the first stage in this process that happens. So water, in addition to having like ions dissolved in it or hydrogen bonding molecules like sugar dissolved in it, it can also have particles suspended in it. And when you have sort of large-ish particles suspended in water, we call that mixture a colloid, spelled out here. Um, Colloids don't have to be in water. They can be in any liquid, or in fact, they could be in the gas phase too. So we would call smoke a colloid because it's like solid particles, small solid particles distributed in the fluid, which is the air. So if it was in water, we have these large particles. Uh, what they do is they make the water cloudy. So it could be mud. It could be like milk. If you drop milk or creamer into water, goes kind of cloudy. Um, if you see water that looks kind of cloudy, that is the result of a colloid or colloidal particles being suspended in the water. Those particles have to be large enough to scatter light. So when light goes through, light gets scattered, and that's why we can't see through it anymore. So 
often water that's present just naturally in a lake or river or whatever could be cloudy often because of like mud or random organic material that could form these particles. Now one thing that we know is that these particles are often covered in negative charges. So these particles, they're charged and water likes to surround them. The positive ends of water like to surround these negative charged particles. And because they're all negative charged, they repel each other. So they don't like to clump together. They like to be spread, dispersed in the water, which makes them a little bit harder to get rid of. Uh, so what we actually do is use something called flocculating agents. And these are typically some sort of positively charged metal ions that have a really high charge. And the most common one that's used is aluminum three plus. And if you put that in the water, what happens is this positive charge attracts the negative charge of the colloidal particles. And it actually causes the particles to all cluster together. And when they all cluster together, they're heavy enough that they kind of settle to the bottom. They clump up and settle to the bottom. So here's an example. This is water that's kind of cloudy. And the colloidal particle here is, here are like algae that's living in the water. And then if you add a little bit of Al3 plus, alum it's sometimes called, to the water and mix it up, you can see they all kind of clump and then settle. And this is a way of what, what we say, we cl it clarifies the water. It makes it easy to see through, right? It gets rid of that junk pretty quickly. And you have to add the right amount. If you don't add enough, it won't clump it all up. And if you add too much, you have all this leftover aluminum in the water, which is bad too. So this process is called flocculation. And it's a way of basically taking suspended small particles, clumping them together and having them removed that way. This is another example. Uh, you can buy little packets, actually, of flocculating agent. There's a, a company that makes, what's the company called? I don't know if I have it here. Um, it's called Pure, P-U-R. You can see it up there. Which is a mixture of a disinfectant and a flocculating agent. And what you could do, if you had a puddle with dirty water in it, you could scoop up that dirty water like you see in here, rip open that little packet and stir it in. And I think they recommend you let it sit for 30 minutes. During that 30 minutes, what it'll do is it'll kill any microorganism that's in there. So it sterilizes the water and it causes all of the muddy particles to flock together, to, to clump up and settle to the bottom. So at the end, you have water here that's drinkable. And this would be like a fantastic little packet to have in your pocket if you're like hiking out in the woods somewhere or things like that. Can I turn up my mic a little bit? Yeah, I guess I'm a little quiet, am I? Let me deal with that here. Is that, that's a little bit louder. Too loud or just, okay. Let me know if that's too, too much. All right, I'm planning a hiking trip this summer actually with my daughter. Um, we're planning a three day hike. Uh, the Chignecto, what is it? Cape Chignecto Trail. Anyway, um, I, I already bought my first thing, which is caffeine pills because I'm like kind of addicted to coffee and I don't want to have to carry all the gear to make coffee on this thing. So caffeine pills are nice and small. I also thought about chocolate covered coffee beans. Problem with that though is they're, uh, um, they can melt, <laughs> number one. And number two, I actually want to make sure I get the right amount of caffeine. Now this is a funny thing. So we have a, a, an analytical lab on campus that actually is part of their business. They measure caffeine levels in beverages that are for sale. And you can pay for a service to bring, you know, a bottle of Pepsi or Kahlua or whatever, and they'll measure it for um, caffeine. So they're gonna do it on my coffee that I make at home. So then I can actually get the exact right amount by taking the right dose of pills. All right, I should get my hands on some of these too. So if I, <laughs> run into trouble, if I don't bring enough water, you can just create as much water as you're gonna need at the moment. Perfect, thanks Rowan, that sounds a little bit better. I can, uh, so what I see on my screen for volume, there's like a green scale and if I'm speaking and it looks green, then the volume is good. 
If it goes into the yellow, it's okay. If it goes into the red, I think it starts to get kind of like loud and scratchy. So I'm trying to keep out of the red. I think we're in the middle of the yellow right now, so we're, I think we're in a good place. Next step, after flocculation, we have now clarified water, but the clarified water could still have things dissolved in it. Not big particles, they've already been removed, but small things, like small organic molecules. Um, and I guess what I mean here is, imagine it's like summertime, late summer, and you're out somewhere in the woods, and there's a lake. And you look in the lake, sometimes the water looks really like kind of brown. And what that is from is when leaves fall into the water, they can decompose, and they put things in the water called, uh, like there's various names for them. There's like fulvic acids, there's humic acids, there's tannins, and basically it kind of looks like tea, like weak tea. So there's a bunch of organic material that's dissolved in the water, and it's just a part of being in an ecosystem where there's leaves and logs in the water and whatever else. Um, that's something we need to get rid of, and that's not something that goes away in the flocculation process. So what we do is we take the water and we run it through a charcoal filter. And you can see over here, this is the coal, charcoal, uh, and sand mixture. So we run the water through that. Now charcoal has this very interesting feature. If, it, if you get charcoal, we sometimes call it activated carbon. And it's little black chunks of carbon, pure elemental carbon. But it has all these cracks that run deep into the, into the little pieces. And what happens is these cracks are like perfect little hiding places for hydrophobic molecules. So molecules that are in water but don't super love being in water can very easily be kind of trapped in charcoal like this. And you see all these kind of uh, yellow things. They could be gases. They could be things like chlorine. They could be these you know, dark compounds that are produced when things decompose in the water. By running the water through this charcoal, basically what you're doing is you're filtering a lot of that crap out of the water. Now, of course, you can't do this forever. Sooner or later, your carbon stops working because you've kind of saturated it with all this junk. And what you'd have to do then is get rid of your carbon and replace it with fresh. So if anyone here has ever had a fish tank, you may know this step. Typically, a fish tank will have a little filter that the water will, it'll pull water through it continuously and recirculate it into the tank, and it'll have this black powder inside the filter. And what that's doing is it's basically um, removing from the water any organic molecules, typically ones that are associated with the fish's own biology. So if the fish takes a dump in the tank, uh, it starts to decompose and it puts all this stuff in the water, it just keeps the water clean. It keeps pulling that stuff out of the water as it goes. These filters can look something like this. There's a couple of different ways they look. Um, I remember we had one as a kid, and my brother had these like little black fish. We called them guppies, maybe they were, I don't know what they were. But they could like somehow get inside, I don't know how they did it, but we would always have to keep taking it apart and let all the little baby ones out, because they used to love to go in there. All right, so if you have something that's an organic molecule, especially if it's nonpolar, charcoal is the way to get rid of it. So what does filtering through charcoal do? It removes nonpolar molecules like Cl2 and organics. What is flocculation? It is um, when fine suspended particles clump together and sink to the bottom. Now before I get too far, I wanna just talk a little bit more about charcoal, because charcoal is a great thing. Um, it's also used a lot in medicine. So if you end up Let's say you overdose on pills. You take way too many pills and you end up in the hospital. Typically what they would often do is, is pump your stomach. It's one of the first things they do. And the way they pump your stomach is force a whole bunch of powdered charcoal into your stomach. So what the charcoal does, because it has all these pores, if you have drugs in your stomach, 
it'll absorb them and sequester them away so that your body can't absorb them. That's the first thing it does. The second thing it does is it actually causes you to throw up. So then it pulls it out of your body entirely. So it's effectively like a big sponge. Take it in your body, soaks up what it can, and then pulls it back out. So this would be common if you like drank way too much, if you took too many pills, if anything like that. If you overdosed because of like an injection or something like that, I don't think this is gonna work to do anything because it's in your blood then, it's not in your stomach, um, but you could use it that way. I have with me actually a, uh, a very interesting product. And I don't know if you can see that here very well. If you're online, I can bring this up. What it is, is um, little charcoal tablets. And this was given to me by a former student in this class. Uh, she was Ukrainian. And um, these pills she bought in the Ukraine. And I don't know if you can read the writing on there, but it's kind of like, here, I'll switch to a bigger view here. It's, I, I don't know what it says, but it's like in Ukrainian. And uh, I know what I can do, look. I can make it so everyone can see this. I'm gonna come over here, change my camera. To this, there we go, look, doesn't that look good? So anyway, it's just this little blister pack and it has little charcoal tablets inside. And so apparently what you do with these is people buy them uh, from a pharmacy. I'm going to switch this back to a normal view. People will buy these from a pharmacy and uh, once you buy them from the pharmacy, you're supposed to, if you're planning to go out drinking, you're supposed to like swallow two of them before you go out and supposedly it prevents you from getting a hangover. I don't think that's going to work. I don't think that's going to do anything at all. Uh, I don't think the cause of hangovers has anything to do with toxins or anything in your stomach that could be absorbed by a pill. Um, I don't think it'll hurt you though. Like carbon is very inert, like it doesn't react, it doesn't absorb by our, be, be absorbed by our body or anything like that. So it's, uh, yeah, pretty innocuous. Good stuff though. Chlorination is the next step and this is the important step because we can remove all of the suspended colloidal particles. We can then remove all the nonpolar organic gases and so on, gases and dissolved substances with the charcoal. But if you're a little microorganism, bacteria or something like that, you can survive those processes and still be in the water. And that's the most dangerous part of drinking water that isn't properly sanitized. So chlorine is, that's where this comes in and chlorine is, a gas, it's uh, yellow looking. You can buy, well you can't, but people can buy cylinders of chlorine, which can be used to bubble into water. And when it's bubbled into water, it is highly, highly deadly for anything that's in the water. It's a very strong oxidizer. So it's like oxygen, but kind of on steroids. It's closer actually, I would say to ozone in the way that it reacts. And you can use this of course to put chlorine into the water, the chlorine will dissolve and kill anything that it comes into contact with. Chlorine was used in World War I as a poison gas by the Germans. Um, so you could take a canister of this and, and throw it into a trench and it's a pretty heavy gas, it'll fill up the trench and people who are there who breathe it in would very quickly pass away. Um, it was very effectively though, filtered out by gas masks. Guess what's in gas masks? Charcoal. They have big filters on the front full of charcoal. So if you breathe it in, the charcoal traps chlorine because chlorine is a nonpolar gas. So charcoal has all kinds of uses. Uh, what about chlorine in the water? Does it make the water dangerous? Well, here's uh, a website that I found, bellcraft.com. And there's a biological chemist named Dr. Herbert Schwartz. And sa he says, 
Putting chlorine in the water supplies is like starting a time bomb. Cancer, heart trouble, premature senility, both mental and physical, are conditions attributable to chlorine-treated water supplies. It is making us grow old um, before our time by producing symptoms of aging, such as hardening of the arteries. Now, this is an example of what I would say a big warning flag, because this is, of course, uh, on a website that's trying to sell you a filter to filter chlorine out of your water. So if they can put a statement on there to scare you about chlorinated water, uh, I think the idea is this might push more of their filters, right? So that's the first warning sign I see. It's on a sales website that's trying to sell you a solution to a problem that they're posting about on their thing. Um, is chlorine safe in the water? Well, what is the concern with chlorine? So chlorine itself, if you drink it in water in small amounts, will have no effect on you. But one thing that chlorine can do is it can react with things that are dissolved in the water. Now hopefully, all the organic molecules are already removed from the water because the, the uh, charcoal step comes before the chlorination step. But if any gets through, um, it's true that chlorine can react with them to make chlorinated molecules. This is a reaction, actually, this is a slide that I took from my organic chemistry class. It's a reaction called radical chlorination. We know all kinds of organic molecules will react with chlorine, it's quite reactive. And it produces organic molecules that have chlorines on them, and these are called chlorination disinfection byproducts. Uh, so that's sometimes called DBP, disinfection byproducts, because of the chlorination. The World Health Organization says the risks to health from DBPs are extremely small in comparison with inadequate disinfection. So there you go. World Health Organization says they're not saying the risk is zero, that there's nothing that chlorinated water, uh, that it absolutely has no dangers. It's just if you get rid of the chlorine and don't disinfect your water, you have a much, 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 much bigger issue or risk of developing serious illness. Uh, chlorine itself, though, is dangerous enough. This was a, a story about um, a clubhouse. Clubhouse, it was sort of like a, a gym, spa type thing, like it had a pool, sauna, hot tubs, this kind of stuff. And there was a leak of chlorine gas. Chlorine gas leak. So um, 50 people including 23 children, were taken to three hospitals, treated for breathlessness, nausea, irritation to the eyes and throat. So, um, this is a, a place where chlorine definitely can cause danger, and chlorine comes in actually a couple of different forms. You see here, it says, he is accused of pumping 200 liters of sodium hypochlorite, which is also bleach, or Javex, um, commonly found in bleach, into the storage tank with 400 liters of hydrochloric acid resulting in chlorine gas being emitted. So this is pretty crazy. What, what the chemical reaction is here that he caused was uh, sodium hypochlorite, which is N-A-O-C-L, reacted with hydrochloric acid, 400 liters of it, and what this makes, Cl2, Na+, plus, and I believe Na, uh, OH-. minus. It's the balanced reaction there. So it produced a bunch of chlorine gas. You would never mix bleach with acid. If you're at home, never mix Javex with vinegar or any other acids you find in your home. It'll make chlorine gas, and if you breathe that in, obviously not very good. Chlorine itself as a gas, I mean, you can buy cylinders of it and like certain utilities may use it, but if you wanna use chlorine in your home, uh, this is a pretty dangerous form because if you leave the cylinder opens or something like that and your room just fills with chlorine gas, that's lights out for you really quickly. So what we often use in your home is a very water soluble form of chlorine, which is sodium hypochlorite. 
which is JAVX or bleach. And this is a strong oxidizer just like Cl2. And so this is something you might put in your laundry. It'll react with all sorts of things. It's used to bleach colors. Um, it's great for if you are trying to disinfect something. So I know like, I don't know, if you, during the COVID times, anyone here work as like a server during COVID and you had to like disinfect all your surfaces? What did you guys use? What is it? Okay, quat is what it's called. Yeah, that's probably um, Ben's alconium chloride. It's like a quaternary ammonium salt. This is, I can see where quat comes from. Um, it's what's in Mr. Clean. Lysol, yeah, so it'd be the same thing. Um, you could use bleach, like you could make a bleach soap solution and wash counters. I guess the problem with that is it takes a while to dry up. Um, you could use bleach like in your laundry, not just to make it white, but to disinfect as well. A lot of people use alcohol too. Like I think Acadia last year, when they go between classes and disinfect all the chairs and stuff, they just had this machine which sprayed alcohol. And uh, it would just work on contact and then dry up. So sodium hypochlorite is very water soluble. Uh, you might use this too if you're living someplace um, where you have well water. And if you are on a well, you should get your well water tested periodically. And one thing they test for is E. coli. So E. coli is, comes from like fecal matter and it could come from if there's like farmland that washes down and makes it that deep or whatever. Uh, and one solution is, is you can like shock your well and by shocking your well, you kind of put like a cup of JAVX down there and just let it kill everything. You might want to give it a while for the chlorine to kind of dissipate, but then you can, you can go ahead. There's another form of it, which is calcium hypochlorite. And calcium hypochlorite chemically does the same thing as JAVX. The difference is though, it's not very soluble. Remember calcium, when it's in water, we said calcium it reacts with soap, reacts with carbonates to make hard water scale. It makes like insoluble solids or not very soluble solids. So if you make the calcium version of hypochlorite instead of the sodium version, the calcium one doesn't dissolve very well. It makes these insoluble white material uh, that's often like fashioned into these like little pucks. And those pucks are used for all sorts of things for disinfecting. Um, often for swimming pools. So swimming pools have a filter as well. And the swimming pool has like a little, um, like a basket you can put in before the water goes into the filter. And you can put these like solid chlorine blocks in there. Anyone ever maintain a pool? <laughs> and these chlorine blocks are uh, the calcium hypochlorite. Or another way you could do it, you get these like little like plastic things where you can put a puck inside and close it and it kind of bobs along the surface of the pool or a hot tub or something like that. And the good thing about these is like if you just took a container of JAVX and dumped it in a pool, you're gonna have a crazy high concentration of hypochlorite. And then as it reacts and does its job, it just kind of like drops over time. If you use calcium hypochlorite, a little bit will dissolve so you'll kind of have like a small concentration, but not a lot all at once. So you could put this in your pool and swim immediately. Um, but also it slowly dissolves, so it kind of maintains a low level chlorine concentration or hypochlorite concentration the entire time for your swimming pool. So there's different variations, I guess, of chlorine. They all do the same thing. They all are strong oxidizers. They react with, uh, microorganisms, they kill them and prevent them from growing. Ozonation is another method uh, like we talked about before. You can buy generators that, that uh, generate ozone. The problem with ozone though, and we talked about ozone before, is that ozone, if you put it in water, yeah, it'll kill everything, but then it, like a, an hour or two later, it just decomposes back into oxygen. So it's great, it'll kill whatever's there, but it has no like residual ability to keep the water clean. Where chlorine does, chlorine stays in the water. So what I mean is, is you have a water treatment plant, you bring in all this water, you filter it, whatever, whatever, 
and then you chlorinate it to kill everything that's in it. If you used ozone, it would do the same thing. It would kill everything in there, and then you s put it through the pipes, and it travels all through the water mains, and it goes through, distributes all through the town or city. The problem is, is if it gets infected somewhere along the way, if it's been treated with ozone, it's just gonna carry that infection right to your house. If it's chlorinated though, that residual chlorine that remains as it goes through the system keeps the entire system uh, basically clean until it, you turn your tap on and it comes out. So there is chlorine still in the water when you turn on your tap, hopefully a very small amount, but enough to prevent anything from breeding and growing in your water like that. So ozone's no good for that. It's great for water bottles, where you shock the water bottles and you put the cap on, and then because it's a sealed system, you know it can't get reinfected later on. But for a distribution system, it's no good. We talked about UV purification as well. UV sea light is highly, highly toxic. Uh, it'll kill microorganisms too, so you can disinfect it that way. Again, that's like ozone, like you wouldn't use this in a treatment plant because the second it leaves, it can get reinfected. This would be like something you would use at the end use, right before you drink it, for example. Uh, you can buy little home filters for this that use UV. Whole home ultraviolet water treatment system. This is a method for disinfecting. Now one old school way to purify water is distillation. And distillation was a technique that was handed to us by the alchemists. They had figured this out early on. Uh, the idea is you could take dirty water or like salt water, and if you boil it, what happens is uh, the salt stays in the water, but the water vapor will travel up, and you can run the vapor through a condenser, which is just a tube that's cooled somehow, and that'll cause the water vapor to recondense back as water, and then it drips out. So what you get over here is, is pure distilled water, no dissolved, salt or solids of any sort, and so you get very, very clean water. This is one of the best ways to clean water if you're trying to get pure, pure water out on the other side. The problem with it is that it takes a tremendous amount of energy. You could never do distillation on a scale to provide a whole town with clean water. It's like the amount of energy that would requ require is just insane. So, the only time we do this is on a small scale, so you can get a jug of it for your irons, right? Or any other household need you might have for it. Um, lab use maybe, or whatever, but um, not usually for, even for drinking water. So yeah, this is a little water still. A still is just a, the equipment that would do distillation. And you can buy these little units, but, um, It'd be pretty rare that you'd want one of these. Distilled water is actually pretty cheap. Like you could buy a gallon of it at the grocery store for like a dollar or two. So that's like a, 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 a large supply. You just go buy it if you need it for whatever. Um, another way of cleaning things up is by a process called reverse osmosis. And osmosis is something probably most people learn about in school. Like, I don't know what grade you learn this in. Probably learn it multiple times, at multiple stages. But osmosis, what it really is, is the transport of water across a membrane. And it has to be like what we call a semi-permeable membrane, meaning it lets some things through, but not others. And uh, the water will always go from where it's low concentration of dissolved material into where there's a high concentration. The goal of the water moving is to balance out the concentrations on the two sides. So if you have a, a solution of blood, so blood is red blood cells. The red blood cells themselves are wrapped in a membrane and the membrane can allow water to go in or out, but it doesn't allow the contents of the cell to go in or out, right? Like we can't let, um, it won't let the hemoglobin out, for example. So you have this dissolved material in the cell and it's surrounded by blood plasma, which also has an ionic concentration. And so in your blood, in your body right now, the plasma has dissolved material at the same concentration as inside the cell, 
So the blood cells are just happy to let water go in and out as it pleases. But if you were to take those blood cells and put them into pure distilled water, what would happen is the distilled water would want to enter the cell to, to dilute it, to balance out the concentration of ions inside and outside the cell. Problem is, if you're distilled water, there's no dissolved material. Water's just going to continue entering the cell until they grow so large they can burst. Then I guess there'll be something in the water when the cells start to burst. We call that kind of a solution, an, a hypotonic solution, just meaning that the solution itself has less dissolved material than inside the cell. Hypertonic would be the opposite. If it was a very, very highly concentrated um, solution of water and something else, like salt or whatever, it will take the water from inside the cell, it'll want to come out, and the salt cells kind of like shrivel and dry up. And that's called a hypertonic solution. Isotonic as if it's the same concentration as your blood cells. So sometimes, you know, in medicine, you might call this a saline solution. So if you have like a wound and you need wound care, uh, a common thing is, is to have it rinsed every once in a while. And if you're going to rinse it, you'd want to rinse it with clean, pure uh, saline solution. Okay, because it'd be the same ionic strength as your blood, so it's not going to dry out or like cause the wound to puff up. Okay. Did you ever have that happen where like, you were wearing like a Band-Aid or something, and you go swimming, and then the Band-Aid like soaks all the water up, and it just stays wet against your skin. And you pull it off, your skin there is all like kind of white and puffy looking. It's like your skin is a semi-permeable membrane, and it can let water through as well. All right, that's osmosis. This was a poster that was in my grade six classroom that I thought I'd throw on there. It's not what it is. So here's an example, we have a beaker and we have a semi-permeable membrane that kind of cuts the beaker in half, halfway through. And on one side you have very dilute, almost clean water, and then you can have concentrated sugar water on the other side. What's gonna happen is the water will go through the membrane to the concentrated side and cause this imbalance in height on the two sides. This imbalance in height will create pressure, a pressure difference between the two sides and the high side will want to go back down. So it'll only continue to go to the left until the pressure gets so high that the pressure is pushing water molecules back through at the same rate they're traveling through naturally. So you reach this sort of a steady state where the water stops rising in the left. I got more examples of osmosis. Here's one when you boil hot dogs. Now I think this, this, I think this is one. I might be wrong though. If you take hot dogs and you boil them, and you boil them too long, sooner or later they split like this. And I think this could be because the hot dogs are really salty. They have a high concentration of dissolved material inside the hot dog. The outside coating of the hot dog is like a semi-permeable membrane. And you put it in water and then you let it like boil. Water will travel across the membrane and it'll enter the hot dog and the hot dog will swell as a result. And sooner or later, it can split. Now, you might have sensed some doubt in when I was talking about this. And I think it's because often if you barbecue hot dogs, they'll split then too. And obviously they're not soaked in water when you barbecue them. So I think there might be actually an ingredient in uh, hot dogs that plump when you cook them, like, like baking powder or something like that. But I'm not sure, I don't know what's in hot dogs. I don't know if anybody does. Osmosis is also why you can have very, very sweet things like honey or jam or things like that and not have to refrigerate them and they'll stay good for a long time. It's because they're essentially like super concentrated sugar solutions and if a bacterium or something lands on it, um, it almost gets dehydrated immediately that all the water will move from inside the cell. It's like a super hypertonic solution and it'll get pulled into the jam. And so that makes it difficult for microorganisms to colonize foods like this. Some are tough though. <laughs> Sooner or later these, I've seen jam go bad, but not honey, I've never seen honey go bad. One more example. 
your contact lenses. If you wear contact lenses, um, you use contact solution to store them. That's an isotonic solution. That means the concentration of salt in the solution is the same as your tears, and it's the same as inside the, um, the contact lens. Contact lens materials now, they're made of like, kind of like a gel, and they're, they're porous, they can dry out, and they get kind of hard and crispy. And then if you soak them, they kind of like swell back out again. Um, if you go out some night with contacts on, and you find yourself staying over at somebody else's house that you maybe weren't initially expecting to stay at, and you might find yourself, well, I need to take my contacts out, I don't want to sleep with them on, but I also don't have my contact case with my saline solution. So the common thing for people to do is find two glasses, pour water in them, and put your contacts in the water. Now the problem with that is that water is a hypotonic solution. And so what happens when you put your contacts in is the contacts will start to pull water in until to dilute the inside, and it'll cause your contact lenses to actually swell. They'll get larger, which doesn't actually hurt them. Like you can put them in your eyes again, and they might feel bad, like they might not feel very comfortable, and they may not even be like the perfect um, prescription anymore. But if you leave them in there long enough, they'll go back to normal because then they're bathed in your tears, and then you'll have the reverse process take place. All right, we're doing good. So reverse osmosis is just basically osmosis, but the direction um, reversed. If you have a, a situation like this, you have a, a tube, you know, that's shaped like a U, and you have a semi-permeable membrane separating two halves, you have salt water on one side, pure water on the other. We know the pure water wants to go through the membrane to the salty side. That's just regular old osmosis, and that'll cause the level here to go up. Well, let's say we take this system and we push on this side. We add like a piston there and we push it down. What you can do is actually force pure water back through the membrane and then the salt just gets very concentrated. This process is called reverse osmosis. It's just osmosis, but forced under pressure to go in the reverse direction. And you can do this just by like having a pump that pumps it through. Sometimes you see these systems where they spin it, and as the water gets pushed to the walls, it gets pushed through filters that way. Um, but effectively what it does is it leaves all the junk behind and only lets the water come through that filter, that membrane. So you can use this to desalinate water if you live somewhere with no fresh water, but you are close to the ocean. You can take salt water, you can pressurize it, this is like a tank which is split in two with a membrane separating the top half and the bottom half. Uh, if you build the pressure up, what you can do is force the clean water through the membrane, all the junk builds up here, and the concentration of the salt would increase in the top, and then what you could do is like flush that out, put fresh water in and do it again, and you do it in cycles. But you'd be constantly getting pure water in on this side. So this takes way less energy to clean water than something like distillation. So this makes a whole lot more sense. Problem is though, like if you put in like 10 liters on this side, you might get like, I don't know, two liters out and eight liters out on this side. So it takes a lot of water to do this, but you know, that's fine if it's the ocean, because that eight liters goes back in the ocean and there's essentially unlimited water in the ocean. But if it's in your well and you're using this process to clean the water that you find in the well because it might contain contaminants like iron or copper or something like that, well, you may have water shortage issues at your home unless you have really good water uh, source. This is a company, New Water, in Singapore. And what they do there uh, for drinking water is they take sewage water. Right? They take water that basically has gone through the whole treatment plant, flushed down people's toilets, run down the drain in people's showers, and it all comes to sewage treatment plant. And they just take that water and they clean it up using reverse osmosis. 
So they have these reverse osmosis machines and they fill up bottles of water and you can buy it. And it's indistinguishable from really any other water source that you would have. It sounds kind of gross given the source, but if you think about it, all the water we drink probably at some point was previously drank by something else and then <laughs> excreted out somehow. I don't know. It's not something you want to dwell on. You don't want to think about it too hard, but you know, the water keeps getting recycled, you know. Same thing with everything in us, like our carbon, our nitrogen. It all comes from, it's all recycled all the time. Same elements getting used over and over again. Maple syrup, it's that time of year again where you can tap maple trees and you get sap and the sap is essentially diluted maple syrup. And um, what you often do is boil off like 90% of the water and then what's left over is um, maple syrup. My brother did this a few years ago. He had some trees on his property he tapped and he bought like a propane burner and went through like several tanks of propane. And he ended up with two liters of syrup at the end and he spent something like $80 on propane to get it. So it was like the world's most expensive syrup. Problem with syrup is it does take a lot of energy to boil water away from something. And what major producers have done in Canada is turn to reverse osmosis. Where what you can do is take the maple syrup sap and use reverse osmosis to basically push out fresh water from it and then the concentrated material that's left over is what you want, that's your syrup. Now they don't push all the water out that way, they usually push out, I don't know, 50, 60% of it, and then they boil it down the rest of the way, because I think the boiling process also contributes to the flavor. But it's important for things like that. Okay, so that's it, water gets chlorinated, goes through the pipes, comes out your tap. What then? Well, you could just drink it straight, it's safe. In fact, in Canada, in Nova Scotia, the drinking water that comes out of our taps is super, super highly regulated. It has to fall within very strict guidelines for any number of substances that could be present in the water. Uh, however, it can contain chlorine or it could contain things that maybe don't taste great. If you are getting water from a well, then there's more variation in what could the quality of the water, what you might expect. So a lot of people choose to get water filtration systems for home, like a Brita, okay? So I wanna talk about what a Brita filter actually is. A Brita filter contains two different materials. One of them is what's called an ion exchange resin. And this is like a zoom up picture of it. It's like, looks, I don't know, like fish eggs or something, but it's like, little resin beads, and it's very similar to what we already looked at as being in the water softeners. And they are covered in sodium ions. And what they do is they grab, they can grab hard water ions like magnesium or calcium, but they also can gra grab toxic metals like, me like lead, like cadmium, um, big heavy metals like that. Copper, it's not so good to have in your water. And so it can remove those metals, and that's the purpose of the ion exchange resin. And the other piece that's in there is the charcoal. So I have a picture for you again. I'm gonna switch my uh, screen up here one more time. Where's my mouse? All right. All right, here. Here's our class. If people online were wondering what it looks like here, we have some people here, but not, not a super ton. So there's lots of room if you want to come in person. I'm upside down. Anyway, what I have here is a cutaway of a Brita filter, and it contains this black material inside that I've dumped out here on the table. So if you kind of look at that, I don't know how too close, I guess. Hard to really see much, right? 
I don't know, if you can see the little balls kind of like rolling. There's two very distinct types of particles if you look at this close enough. There's chunks of charcoal, and then there's these little balls, and they roll around. I don't know if you can, can you see that? And the little balls look almost like a little bit yellow. I thought it was kind of good. You know what I mean. Those little balls are the ion exchange resin beads. And you can see them, they're traveling down the side of the paper here now when I shake the paper. And then the charcoal is a little more chunky and it kind of stays behind and you see the picture like that. So you can see the two components of the Brita filter. Let's go back to our normal view. And what these two things are, the ion exchange resin is there to grab the heavy metal cations. And the charcoal is there to remove the chlorine. Or, I mean, any other nonpolar material, but basically it's the chlorine. And the chlorine is probably the most important part to remove because that's the part that kind of gives it a certain taste. So if the reason you're doing this is to make it taste better, then probably the best bang for your buck is to get a charcoal filter and that'll make the water certainly, it'll, it'll change the taste for sure. I would say probably in most places, the ion exchange resin is probably pretty unnecessary. Like there's really not much in the way of heavy metal ions to remove from most water. Like lead, cadmium is not an issue anyway, but I guess why not? You can put it in there if you like. There's another co competitor to Brita I've seen, and I think it's called maybe zero water. I don't know, but it comes with actually a little like conductivity meter and you put it in the water and you can like measure the concentration of dissolved ions before and after. And it'll show you how it like removes all the ions that are in there. I mean, that's fine, I guess, but a lot of the ions that are present in our tap water are, are not bad for us anyway. Um, Brita has a bit of an issue in that, you know, they're disposable, they're plastic, and the inside materials basically can't be recycled. So it, it does create quite a lot of garbage. And, uh, you know, it's better than using bottles of water every time you drink, but certainly there's still a, a garbage issue associated with them. Some places, Germany apparently, can filter Brita filters, but not the US. This is a plug for a local company, a company based out of Dartmouth, I think. Uh, they're called GAC filters, G-A-C filters, and I have a container of one of them here. The little piece inside actually broke in my bag, so there's like a ton of charcoal in my bag right now. What they are, and you can see a picture of one on the screen here, it's like a little tea bag looking thing, and it just contains granulated charcoal. GAC is granulated activated carbon, and um, essentially what you do, if you have a water bottle, you could just drop one of these in there, and it will just sit there and pull out any chlorine or anything that's in your water just sort of passively. And apparently one, these little tea bags are about a dollar each. They will each treat about 60 liters of water. And then when you're done with them, you can toss them in the compost, but they're 100% compostable as well. And so it's a nice little local company. I think these would be great little additions for like a water bottle. You know, if you keep have a water bottle and you're, I don't know, training for a team or whatever, and you're always refilling your bottle. Um, if you don't have access to filtered water, you can just throw one of these in there and it'll take the chlorine out, it'll improve the taste and uh, something you can try. An interesting aside, this company, remember I showed you my carbon pills a few minute, minutes ago? And I told you there was a student in the class who gave them to me who was Ukrainian. She actually was also the uh, spokesperson for this company. So I think if you go on their website, there's still like ads and she, she goes on. It's kind of funny, like she, she plugs into this course a couple ways. Why do we add chlorine to drinking water? It's to kill microbes and provide residual disinfection, meaning it keeps the water clean all the way through its journey from the water treatment plant to your house. 
What component of Brita filters will remove heavy metals? And that's the ion exchange resin. Okay. There's charcoal in there too. There's no fluoride. TPP we talked about, that was the phosphate stuff they were putting in soap that was converting hard water to not hard water. That's not in Brita either. Okay, the next issue that I wanted to talk about, and this one is probably the only one that really has any controversy at all around it, and this is fluoridation of drinking water. And this is an issue um, in many different places, and it's, it's done, I would say, in Canada right now, about 50% of, of municipalities will fluoridate their water, add fluoride to the drinking water, and about half don't. And I actually don't know what the story is in Wolfville, if they do or not. But the reason they do it is to improve dental health. It's known to strengthen the enamel of your teeth and reduce the incidence of cavities. And it's quite interesting because the original work on this was done in like the 1950s and 1960s, and it was actually done by a dentist slash epidemiologist who noticed just through his practice that in some communities, like nobody got cavities. And then other communities, a whole bunch of people did. And he was trying to, he was like fascinated with what factor could it be community-wide that is, you know, and it wasn't their diet, it wasn't their food supply or what they drank or anything. And what he ended up figuring out must be the cause was the natural levels of fluoride in the water supply that was being used to, to you know, make the drinking water to go to these different places. And he found this correlation and he looked at other places and looked at tooth decay rates. And so he proposed, let's put fluoride in the drinking water and see if that reduces cavities in these areas where they're high. And they did, and immediately they saw like a 50% drop in cavities in communities where they added the fluoride to the water. So it's a practice that sort of continued to, these, to this day. We actually know why it does this now. Uh, there's a chemical uh, in the enamel of your teeth, which is called apatite, which I think is spelled A-P-A-T-I-T-E. And it's, there's something called hydroxyapatite, which actually dissolves in acid. Uh, and what acid does is it attaches to an OH on hydroxyapatite and helps break it down. Uh, if you add fluoride, it kicks away the hydroxy groups and replaces them with fluorides. They can't react with acid, and it makes your teeth basically protected against acid breakdown. So what do they add to the water to make it fluoridated? There's actually three different chemicals that they could use, depending on where you live. They could just use sodium fluoride, which is an ionic compound. It's a salt. It forms this three-dimensional lattice of Na plus, F minus, Na plus, F minus. Goes in the water, it dissolves, and now you have fluoride in the water. Uh, that's only used about 10% of the time. There's cheaper alternatives, and these are called either sodium or uh, sodium fluorosilicate, or the same compound where the sodiums are replaced with hydrogens. And this is actually a byproduct from the fertilizer industry. That when the fertil industry makes fertilizer, they actually get this as a, as a side product. And it turns out what happens is that compound, H2SIF6, will break down in water to make F minus, uh, and make six of them, 2H plus plus SiO2. So I guess we actually probably need six of these and we need three waters. No, two waters. And now we have a balanced equation. So what this has done, SiO2 is formed, fluoride's in the water, it's got a negative charge. It's the same fluoride that would be there if it was sodium fluoride. SiO2 though, that's called silicon dioxide. Silicon dioxide can be found in a couple of different forms. Has anyone ever hear of silicon dioxide before? Yeah, where, where have you heard of it? If you buy 
uh, sometimes called silica. If you buy like shoes or something, there's often little packets of silica in there to desiccate it, to keep it dry. That's silica. Uh, another name for silica is sand. Sand is silicon dioxide. Glass is silicon dioxide. Glass is just melted sand. Um, so what happens is you put this in water and you get fluoride in the water and then this forms a solid sand and drops to the bottom. So the silicon dioxide never makes it to your house. It basically reacts with the water, makes sand, falls to the bottom, they filter it, and then pump the rest of the water with the fluoride in it to go on its merry way. So there we go. You can use either the H2 or the Na2, both work fine. So Health Canada says that the recommended fluoridation levels uh, in Canada should be somewhere between 0.5 to 1 milligram per liter. So this issue has been studied in detail. It's known what concentrations are effective. And the idea is we should put in the minimum amount that's effective and not put in more than that. They said the maximum allowable is 1.5 milligrams per liter. So we shouldn't exceed that number in any municipality in Canada. So this is fine. This is actually a, a neat plot from 2007. It's not that different today. Uh, sometimes this information can be hard to get your hands on. But essentially what it is, it's the percentage of the population that drink fluoridated water per province in Canada uh, versus those without. And it's about 50-50 in Canada, depending on where you live. Where in Nova Scotia, we're probably a little bit more likely to be drinking fluoridated water than most other places. So it's not a universal thing. Some places have it and some places don't, okay? Some places actually have naturally high levels of fluoride in the water. In fact, too high. So this is a map of, of Newfoundland where everywhere where you see a red dot are areas where the local groundwater concentration of fluoride exceeds the maximum allowable limit by Health Canada just because of natural minerals and whatever that's underground that's in contact with the water. So, you know, in those situations, I guess the best way to get rid of the extra fluoride would be reverse osmosis. So you could remove it that way. Um, this is a map of the world showing um, the regions in pink where groundwater has higher than one and a half milligrams per liter. So that'd be too high for what's ideal. What does too high actually mean? Well, there's all kinds of conspiracy theories out there as to why fluoride's in the water and what it can do to us. Um, this one says, uh, what does it say? Fluoride is so toxic that it's considered hazardous waste by the EPA. Um, if you had a tank of that H2SIF6, yeah, that's toxic. You would not want to deal with that straight up. But if you pour it in water, first of all, it reacts with the water to make fluoride ions. And then the rest becomes sand, filters out. So by the time it comes to your home, there's none of this in your tap water anymore. It's reacted away. Also, and the picture makes you think like you can just have fluoride. You cannot have just fluoride minus. You can't fill a container with just F minus. Because fluoride minus will repel other fluoride minuses. The only way you can have F minus is if you have something else with the opposite charge to counterbalance it. So you could have Na plus and F minus together and have a, you know, a container of that. It's a white powder, but you can't just have fluoride. The other thing that drives me a little crazy, which is unrelated to chemistry in this cartoon, is they just like poked a hole in the water main. Does anyone ever see a water main with a hole in it? These guys would be dead. Like water in a water main is under extreme pressure. And if it breaks and you're like standing right over it, the force of that water coming through that hole would easily rip you to pieces. They do the same thing in Batman Begins. If you ever saw that movie, they're trying to add something to the, water's town, the town's water supply and they just go to a water main and crack it open, 
searches are pouring things in. And it's like trickling along in there. It's like, no, no. If it's in a water main, it's under extremely high pressure. But anyway, this is a conspiracy theory. This is not a real concern. Here's another one. Extremely neurotoxic chemical added to drinking water that interrupts the basic function of nerve cells, causing docile submissive behavior and IQ devastation. The story here is that uh, supposedly the government puts this in our water because it makes us obedient and we don't question authority if we're drinking water that has fluoride in it. Again, not true, right? Of course, it's a conspiracy theory and you go, you'd be blue in the face if you argued every conspiracy theory. Uh, another one like this, you know, makes you dumb, things like that. So this has the red flag of like laundry list, cause of all evils, right? So there's plenty of, I'm not going to say literature, there's plenty of sources available online that'll tell you all sorts of things about fluoride and water, which are definitely <laughs> of dubious uh, truth. So is fluoride a problem at all? Why don't we just, why do we have a limit if fluoride is supposed to be bad? Uh, well, there is a problem that you can get if you have too much fluoride. The problem is called uh, dental fluorosis. Dental fluorosis is if you have too much fluoride come in contact with your, the enamel of your teeth. Um, it can cause like discoloring and pitting of your enamel. And the solution to that is take in less uh, fluoride, of course. Um, and this is mostly a cosmetic problem. Like maybe in severe cases, it might cause damage to your teeth, but um, it's mostly cosmetic, meaning it will make your teeth look discolored, but it won't accelerate their decay or cause you any health issues. Uh, this was a study that was done looking at the population in different areas. Um, and it was all in kids or people that were under 20 at least. And it was basically taking people in different communities, measuring the amount of fluoride in the water that they were drinking and looking at the rate of dental fluorosis in the population. And so what they found was, you know, if you had like eight milligrams per mil, which is on the high end of the scale, yeah, you get like half the people with this dental fluorosis problem. Remember the Health Canada limit was one and a half. So below one and a half, and the recommendation was somewhere between here. At those levels, the incidence in the population was zero for all communities studied. And it wasn't really until you're kind of above two that you started to see it start to appear. And then of course it increases as the amount in the population increases. So this was interesting. About 10 years ago, there was a debate in Cape Breton, CBRM, Cape Breton Regional Municipality, as to whether uh, fluoride should be still used in the drinking water there. If you read this article, um, Robert, Robert Strang was still on the go then. He was still the chief medical, chief medical what? I don't know. Um, Medical Officer of Health, I guess is the title. So what they did was there was this debate. Um, the counselors put off a decision. They wanted to hear from people uh, before they made a decision. And they had these sort of public meetings. And uh, somebody named Marlene Kane said, called it hazardous waste. It was ineffective and costly and a long list of negative health effects. So this is presented as data. Um, she said it's widely available in toothpaste and dental treatments and so on and so on. There was an argument just before this in Calgary where the politicians there voted uh, to remove it from the drinking water. And actually their um, tooth decay rates skyrocketed after. The interesting thing for me though about this particular debate uh, and this particular article is that at that time on CBC News, you could leave comments, like you can in many sites, but um, if people could then upvote or downvote the comments, most, a lot of places still have that, but all you see is the aggregate, 
what this would is show you the number of ups and the number of downs and the aggregate, which was interesting because when people make comments and other people read the comments and then upvote or downvote them, it gives you a bit of insight into how the public perceives the issue. So here were some of the comments on this particular article. Why can't water just be water? Which I take that as don't put fluoride in the water. And that got 61 thumbs up and 10 thumbs down. So that was like a popular opinion for sure. Here's another one. Why add fluoride to water considering every six months when you go to the dentist, you get that awful fluoride mouthwash treatment. Just the thought of that makes me gag. That got 38 ups, 26 down. So, you know, a little more divided, but a lot of people didn't like that. Apparently the annual flu shot has a general utility for the general population as well. Uh, why not introduce that into our water system? Why not a little rye with my water at Christmas time? Point is, if people want to ingest fluoride, let them put it on the end of their toothbrush and swallow away. Fluoride is a chemical, true. In which case the fluoridation of drinking water uh, gives municipal level governments more power over you than your family doctor. At least doctors can't order you to take chemical substances into your body. So this is a very interesting, um, that was a very popular comment by the way. Um, this is the, the crux of this issue. Where is the balance between your right to having complete 100% uh, autonomy over your own life? In other words, your freedom. Balancing that with the good of society. And this has been tested in a big way during the pandemic. We're all wearing masks here, right? Probably not very many of us in this classroom are vulnerable, but probably some are, or are living with people that are, and so on. So, you know, Acadia has made the decision that wearing a mask, um, although it was maybe a mild inconvenience for us, overall has, you know, very positive uh, effects overall. It's worth it. Um, the fluoride thing is, is the same thing. We're putting fluoride in the drinking water. We're taking away a lot of people's ability to decide if they want fluoride in their water or not. Although they could always get an RO system, reverse osmosis, and take it out if they want. Uh, or buy drinking water from, you know, bottles or dig a well or whatever. Um, so is the people's right to determine what's in their water, does that supersede the public benefit of providing protection for people uh, against tooth decay? And that's an interesting question. I don't have like a, a, a very great answer for that, uh, where exactly that line is. Uh, we do it all the time though. We have all sorts of public methods of delivering chemicals to the population for our own good. Milk has vitamin D added to it if you buy it, right? Um, bread, flour is fortified. It's got folic acid and niacin added. It's got all these things added. Uh, salt is um, treated with sodium iodide. It helps prevent goiters and it helps, if you want to Google something fun, Google goiter. Um, it's, uh, protects thyroid problems, right? So we have all sorts of examples like this. Should we? And that, that's a question to think about. That's not a question I'm gonna uh, give you a, a hard answer to. I have my own opinions for sure, right? But people certainly definitely differ on that thing. Here was one of my favorite comments. It's all about quantity. Too little fluoride, your teeth rot. Too much, it's toxic. Oxygen, water, salt, everything are the same. You just need the right amount. No one takes in no fluoride. It's impossible to avoid. And by the way, oxygen, water, and common salt are just as much chemicals as fluoride and good luck trying to live without them. So this was the first comment that added the nuance of quantity, which was a core thing that we talked about earlier on in this course. It's no use talking about the danger of some chemical if you're not talking about how much of this you're actually getting, what the dose is. This was a wildly unpopular comment though, right? The average person did disagreed with that. There's nothing in my mind to disagree about with that comment. 
But people don't like nuance. People don't want to think about abstract things like dose. They want good or bad. Fluoride needs to be in the good camp or bad camp, and then they can move on. Most people don't like getting into the finer details. It's good if or it's bad when. No, good or bad, that's all I want. Look at this one, negative 26. It is insane this is being discussed. There's a mountain of scientific evidence that fluoride in drinking water is beneficial. True. It is the most effective way to decrease levels of tooth decay in a population. There's no evidence that these low levels produce any negative health effects whatsoever. It's also not costly. Fluoridating water is ridiculously cheap compared to the benefits it provides. Fluoridating the water is like vaccinating people for diseases. It's a public health benefit. Saying that fluoride is available in toothpastes and dental treatments assumes two things. One, that the majority of people brush their teeth frequently enough and properly. And two, that everyone goes to the dentist regularly for checkups and cleanings. Both of these are not good assumptions to make, especially for children. There is already a higher rate of childhood decay in Cape Breton, according to the dentist there. Remove the fluoride in the water and see what happens. This is getting pressed because of Calgary's recent decision, but the question is, if Calgary jumped off a bridge, would we follow suit? So I like that comment too. The public did not. So it's, it's funny, you know, you have these beliefs and understanding and, and by and large, the public has the opposite flip on it, right? And when I say the public, I don't know if this is the public. Like, it's a bunch of people that went on this article and clicked up or down. Like, it could have been a group of anti-whatever fluoriders, if that's a thing. And uh, remind me, like, you know, the <laughs> Florida? Anti-fluoride? No, nah, I don't know. I like this one, too. We should get rid of iodine and salt. Iodine's a poison, right? So salt being iodine is part of the conspiracy. Vitamin D in milk, et cetera. I mean, it wasn't a very uh, well-written comment, but anyway. Dr. Tompkins, president of the Ontario Dental Association, says, uh, we know that community water fluoridation is safe and effective and reaches all populations, prevents tooth decay. We are very, very much in favor of community water fluoridation. There's a tremendous body of scientific evidence that does show that water fluoridation in the right amount is safe and effective. We have the support of over 90 national and international organizations, such as the World Health Organization, CDC, Health Canada. They all agree that water fluoridation is safe and effective. We all benefit from it, because that fluoride uh, that is secreted in your saliva, bathes your teeth daily, helps reduce decay. It's an important adjunct to all the other things you do to keep your teeth healthy, and you do benefit from it at any age. That's a pretty clear uh, endorsement from an expert in the field, backed up with scientific evidence and all the things that I, I want you guys to use when you make decisions about things in your life. Um, I find, I just find this uh, quite interesting, the juxtaposition of opinions on topics like this. And it's like all kinds of things, like the vaccine was like this for COVID. Um, all those things that we've talked about in the past where the public perception, or at least the vocal public perception, is so disconnected with what the experts in the field know to be the case. And maybe that's partly our fault as, as scientists. Like, are we effectively communicating what is real and why we know it's real? You know, and I don't know. I don't know what, what the answer to that question is. I guess I'm doing my part here by teaching you guys, but like, I don't know. We could always do better, I suppose. Oh, by the way, I, I kind of leaving it on a, on a edge of a cliff here. What do you think happened in Cape Breton? Did they keep the, the fluoride or did they get rid of it? They voted to keep it, so they still have it. So if you're in fluoride, or if you're in fluoride, if you're in Cape Breton, you still have it. Uh, <laughs> coming from a Cape Bretoner perspective, majority like to complain and do not like to open their minds to new possibilities. They like to be set in their ways. Well, I don't think that's just Cape Breton. I think that's everywhere. Um, the, the, the quote I like is it's, you can't reason somebody out of an opinion they didn't reason themselves into. So if somebody makes an opinion, um, 
it can be very difficult to convince them their opinion isn't correct if, they, if the opinion came from something other than looking at evidence, right? If the opinion came from their political affiliation or their favorite celebrity said this or whatever, if it came from a non-reasoned source, it's, you can't reason them into the, to the right source in many cases. What's the other quote that I like? Um, I forget it, I'll, I'll, it'll come to me. I don't wanna sit here and, maybe I do. What's the other quote? Oh, this one, yeah. It's easier to fool someone than to convince them that they've been fooled. Right, so if someone has been fooled into taking in a, a, an a you know, what we might say is a ridiculous stance, like let's say flat earth supporter, uh, convincing them that they were fooled into that decision is harder to do than to fool them into that decision in the first place, and often, often is the case. All right, a couple questions. Let's do some questions here. Uh, why do we add fluorosilicic acid to drinking water to promote dental health? And that's it. And I think we're at, at time, aren't we? 2.22? Yeah, I think we're good. We went two minutes over, I apologize folks. Um, but I think we had a good class and we have a little bit left in this unit and then we can move on to cannabis. Great. All right, we'll see everybody.